this week on Cross. Giving up carbon for Lent. Text messages from the Pope. The Pope prays for the Jews. Bad Pope. What is heaven really like? And are your lips blood of Christ red? Good evening, everybody. I am Pastor Jim Butler out in beautiful St. Luke's Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome, everyone, to Crossfeed Religious News. Yeah, and happy Valentine's Day. Well, it won't be anymore by the time you see this, but it is when we're recording this. That's yes, right. this is how we spend our Valentine's evening. <laughs> I spent mind balling dancing. Thank you very much. Well, my wife's on her way to a dance class. Um, you'll probably hear the door shut in just a minute, but um, <laughs> it's uh, but she's going alone. <laughs> now, my wife and I are taking a class on Thursday nights in ballroom dancing. So, being sponsored by my congregation. So, I'm not very good at it. I cannot sing. I cannot dance. I can barely put two sentences together. Well, I can't dance, and that's why I'm not going tonight. <laughs> she keeps trying to convince me to, but um, I keep telling her that it's for her own good and for the good of everybody else there that I don't. So, My wife doesn't mind me dancing, especially since I bought her a pair of steel-toed dance shoes. <laughs> Man's got to know his limitations. After that, she's been fine. But it is St. Valentine's Day, um, as in Valentine the Martyr. There's actually several Valentines or Valentinus um, in the early Christian church. And, uh, and no one's really sure which one or, or more that, uh, that this feast is celebrating. But uh, sort of the, the legendary one was a Christian who appeared before Claudius, uh, Emperor Claudius II. And uh, Claudius was so impressed with Valentine, or Valentinus, uh, that he tried to convert him to paganism so that he wouldn't have to kill him. But Valentinus tried to convert Claudius to uh, Christianity and was executed. But there's a story about him uh, sending letters to his beloved uh, and sign them your Valentine and uh, or from your Valentine, and that's where that's why we spend you know billions of dollars this time of year on um, <laughs> cheesy cards. <laughs> okay, my kids when they were in grade school, we bought the cheesy cards, right? You know the Tina, the, the mutant ninja, and the uh, you know um, yep. Animaniacs. Um, cards, you know, but my wife and I, we go to Walmart when we're shopping, we walk over to the card section, I pick one up, here, this is yours, and she picks one up and says, here, this is yours, and we read them and we put them back and that's it, so, no cards, <laughs> I like that, <laughs> no, no roses, nothing. You know why? Because we're trying to live a carbon-neutral oh. lifestyle. That's why. You ought to give up carbon. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have uh, two senior Church of England bishops, uh, the Right Reverend James Jones and the Right Reverend Richard Chartres. And... Uh, they want everybody to, instead of giving up chocolate... See, now, what about the people that give up chocolate, and then they get chocolate for Valentine's Day? Well, sometimes Lent's late anyway. on his fish. <laughs> right, yeah, so that, that kind of poses a problem. But... Anyway, so, um, he says instead of giving up chocolate or alcohol, um, which Jim has given up, mm -hmm. um, instead you should try to lower your carbon footprint. 
and suggestions are avoiding plastic bags, giving the dishwasher a day off, insulating the hot water tank, and checking the house for drafts with a ribbon and buying draft excluders. Or we call them door snakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one they had was to change your light bulbs to um, um, the fluorescent ones. That was another thing. Now, of course, I want to ask them, what do you do if you already do that? My wife and I use uh, reuse the same um, grocery bags. We bought them the, the kind of fibrous, recyclable, so recycled things for a buck each. Uh, we probably use our dishwasher twice a week. Um, <clears throat> we uh, every fall we go around the house and we caulk everything before the winter hits. And except for the lights in this room, because they uh, are an adjustable light switch, every light in our entire house is um, fluorescent. Actually, I actually have a question about those compact fluorescents, and we use them wherever we can. We actually we're slowly switching over. Uh, we still have some incandescents, and I figure it's not really good for the environment to just throw them out for no reason. Right. So we're using them until they burn out, and it won't be much longer. Um, we do have above our um, our dining room table where I'm sitting, uh, we have a sort of chandelier um, that uses clear globe lights, and it would look kind of goofy with those swirly things in it. So um, for the time being, we're still using incandescents there, but that's about the only place that um, that we're sticking. In fact, we have a ceiling fan that we put the um, the compact fluorescents. They have the, the kind of cover over them, mm-hmm. so they look like regular incandescents. Um, I'm not real impressed with them, though. Uh, I got – it has three spots, and, and they take – I put 40 waters in there because I figure 120 watt or, you know, equivalent um, – would be enough for the living room, and it's not at all. They're not as bright as they claim to be. So, but yeah, I, I'm not gonna give the dishwasher a break, though. <laughs> not with uh, three three kids still at home. Um, no, I can't. I can't blame you there. But you know, I I mean, it was it was. A, I, mean, I guess they're nice ideas. Sometimes I I, I don't know because uh, it talks about. Uh, I confess, okay, I'm, I'm a disbeliever in, in, car, in global warming. I think it's a good idea because as Christian peoples, we should take care of God's world. I mean, you know, we didn't make it. Um, for all you people out there who, you see, if you, for the people who believe in evolution, why, why care? I mean, you know, it took a million years to get the world this way. Another bill, couple billion years, it'll be back to normal. I mean, you know, for us, you know, this is God's world. God created it. He's letting us use it. Uh, good stewardship. That's what it's come down to. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we've got to be good stewards of what God has created. Dale's having a good time playing back there, as you notice. Um, I'm sorry. There he is. is... Oh, you had it there just a second. But, <laughs> I mean, this is all stewardship. But I'm not sure I would count it as a Latin discipline. Yeah. Uh, what was interesting was this, this woman who... Um, you know, also wrote, and you know, it was kind of funny because she uh, did her carbon footprint and said, um, you know, she was using all this. Well, it was because of all these jet, all these flights she had to take uh, for work, two of which were to uh, um, conferences on climate change. Now, why is it that the people who are concerned <laughs> about climate change are flying? To conferences on climate change. I mean, can't they just teleconference? That's like Al Gore flying around the country in his private jet. Right. I mean, uh, like last year, I think I might have mentioned on here before, uh, when we were talking this, you know, Al Gore standing up there to get his Academy Award last year, and, you know, it was, you know, putting different things on the back that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint. One of them was, you know, use public transportation. I mean, come on, these are a bunch of Hollywood actors. Their idea of public transportation is, you know, sharing a limousine with someone else. You know, mm-hmm. You're not going you know, to see Tom Cruise on the subway. 
But give me my nope, preferences going likely. from my house into Boston. So, I'll take the train every time. I love taking the train into Boston. <laughs> Only a fool will drive in Boston. I'm not crazy. Yeah, see, I, you know, I think these are all a good idea, but I honestly take a very selfish approach to it. I'm just trying to save money. Well, we live in a parsonage, so I'm trying to save the church money because they pay our utilities. But, um, you know, as far as I, I live in the state where um, ethanol is king. Yes. Um, and there was just a, there was a study that was just done that they found that uh, because of of the need for corn for ethanol, they are cutting down forests to grow more corn. Well, the uh, carbon emissions that they're saving by using ethanol are less than the uh, than the what the trees that they're cutting down can make up for. So the um, it, it was a difference of you you save like thirty percent or something like that. Um, on the carbon emissions with the ethanol, but the trees in the forests are like 95% or something like that was, was the difference. And so it was just, it was like, now hold on a minute here. This is working. We're working against ourselves. If we're really trying to cut down the amount of carbon dioxide, um, you know, which I'm kind of skeptical of anyway, um, <laughs> this isn't working. So, you know, if, if we're going to do this, and, you know, this isn't a real popular thing in Iowa because uh, we've got all these corn farmers that like getting their big paychecks, but um, well, I gotta kick out <laughs> we're better of, off um, coming up with something else. I got a kick out of uh, George Will, who points out you could save more energy by keeping your tires properly inflated, you know, than, than the oil they could save from that. Uh, again, I there's, there's a link on this article uh, by... Uh, this Hazel Southam, who's, I guess, one of these people who's going to do it. She's the one who found out about the stuff. So she talked to this bishop of Liverpool. And he says, I've sat with elders in Africa, India, and Central America and asked the question, has the weather changed in your lifetime? The answer, yes, comes from stories of cyclones, rivers drying up, harvests failing, and flooding. I- I'm-, I'm really just kind of wondering what's new about this. I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, I, in your I mean, lifetime, nothing. There was a... I, I live in America. There in the were... 30s, they had this thing called the Dust Bowl. You know, was this was... You know, I mean... Um, I, I mean, you can, you, can, you can point out extremes, you know, of, of, of weather everywhere. I, I guess, you know, I didn't know that. That's why they didn't rain for three years when Elijah was around. I guess they could have blamed that on global warming. <laughs> Yeah, it was all those uh, burnt offerings. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, okay. Producing <laughs> carbon. <laughs> well, there was in the um. Oh, somebody just found a. There was a newspaper article uh, that somebody found in some library archives um, that was talking about uh, global warming, um, and this was dated in the 1920s. They were noticing uh, global climate change. Well, you know that was. Industrial Revolution hadn't been going that long that they could be, you know, if that's the case, we should be really noticing differences now, you know, compared to to back then. I mean, it should be just exponential, and it's not. Of course, so. and I, I am a child of the 70s, and I distinctly remember being told in science class in the 70s that it was global cooling. That was it. You know, the Earth was getting colder. And, uh, you know, and everything was going to get colder. And, uh, then I, and then I remember when I was in college, I was in school, well, we're not really sure, you know, that they're putting this in and it looks like it's this greenhouse gas. What the result is going to be, we're really not sure. Uh, and then all of that sudden now it's, it's warming. So it's, I don't, I, we're good stewards. We have to take care of God's school. We need to take proper care of it. I mean, um, I don't want anybody out there sitting there. I'm skeptical, but it seems to me either way, we need to be good stewards. That's the important thing, that we take good care of God's will. Yep. 
and Dale's hiding behind my picture now. <laughs> Sorry, the heat just kicked in and it's blowing my backdrop around. Ah, okay. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of carbon emissions, our furnace just kicked in. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to move my picture. It's a sign from God. Quickly, and then you can see the guy's picture there behind Dale. See there, there he is. So uh, I moved I moved up into a corner here so that you could see the guy's picture behind you. By the way, okay. I have a purple shirt like that. So people, so so the guys in my circuit, all call me Bishop. I didn't know. Oh, color, I thought it had something to do with living in Massachusetts. No. Well, that would be lavender. That would be Provincetown. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so well, well, we just okay, maybe somebody. maybe if we don't give up carbon, maybe we can give up cosmetics. I don't know. I'd make some kind of segue. <laughs> We go. Or speaking of offending people, oh no, it's gonna keep switching again. <sighs> I'm gonna fix this anyway. Yeah, this this is a interesting little article um, over in Singapore, and they had these Jesus Thames cosmetics, um, and the Singapore shoppers were said that they said, you know, they 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 extolled the virtues of looking good for Jesus. Uh, promising to redeem your reputation and more. Uh, virtu- virtuous vanilla, uh, get tight with Christ hand and body cream, uh, bubble bath that makes you feel like you're walking on water. Hey man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Uh, and it said uh, there were sexual Indian innuendos in the messages and the way Jesus is portrayed in these products. Then we're in trouble. Okay. Yeah, you see the yeah, yeah, right there. Okay. picture of Jesus put the girl. All right, here's the deal. The, the, um, the, the, the website, if, if you go to it's bluequeue.com, B-L-U-E-Q, and um, if you go to it, it's a novelty site. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty offensive to most people. But they're not trying to be serious, all right? You gotta understand that right from the outset. Now, why, uh, a uh, retail store would, um, would stock these things is really questionable because that's, you know, this stuff kind of reminds me of if you go to, uh, oldlutheran.com, they, they do a sort of a Lutheran spin on this where they have, uh, um, Luther is my homeboy t-shirts and um they've got uh black hats with a little white thing there for your pastors and my favorite t-shirt that says my pastor can beat your pastor to a pulpit and uh and they have uh coffee or yeah coffee this this is most certainly brew mm-hmm. um whereas in uh in the Luther small catechism it ends the each definite each uh explanation to the articles of the creed with this is most certainly true so different stuff like that and this is kind of like that except it's not just a, um a, a christian parody kind of thing uh they've got all kinds of stuff but this kind of reminds me if you walk into like a spencer gifts mm. um store in the mall it's kind of that kind of stuff um without all the weird heavy metal and skulls and stuff like that um but it's yeah it's 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 just it's the kind of stuff that uh you know they they also have uh categories like um I got a bad feeling about this well <laughs> uh wash away your sins soap and um and a, and a full line of cat butt uh products so yeah <laughs> and it's, it's stuff with pictures of cat's butts. <laughs> well, actually, there's a woman in my wife's office with a bunch of those in her cubicle. So my, I might have to show my wife that website. But anyway, but do they have, <laughs> you know, Mama Muhammad uh, cosmetics? And, you know, that's a good point. You know, I mean, do they have, you know, uh, you know, you know, Jihad gel? <laughs> you know, 
I'm just detecting a whole new product line that would be just a, you know a, a real well, target for uh, Carter Blood Wet Red. You know, I mean, I'm just just wondering here. You know, Seventy virgin then, virtuous, you know, vanilla. Yeah, something tells me that okay. Uh, one story that we haven't covered that's actually been in the news a lot lately um, is the uh, the Scientologist being attacked by this anonymous group. Uh, that they're getting uh, denial of service attacks on their websites, and they're getting protested um, with people wearing masks and picketing and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And um, and of course they're anonymous because they don't want to get sued. Um, I'm, I'm just imagining uh, somebody doing something like that uh, to uh, to Muslims. <laughs> something tells me being sued, you know, wouldn't be. And, and I should say it's radical Islam or radical Muslims, I suppose. But, um, you know, <laughs> I don't think being sued is what they'd have to worry about. If you came up with a product line like this, <laughs> I think your your website being attacked or hacked would be the least of your problems. And I think that in general, people would be a whole lot more offended by it, too. There's no escape. Don't make me destroy you. Yep, I think they would be probably pretty uh, upset. Are you totally deranged? Well, it is interesting, though, that, you know, uh, uh, although Singapore, you know, Christians only make up 15% of the, the population, and, you know, they could have said, you know, heck with it, you know, look, you're, you're 15%, what do we care? Uh, you know, they, they, they took it seriously, and, you know, these stores pulled the stuff down because the people were so outraged. I've done a lot of things you don't know about. Which I thought was kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, you know, that's good. I, it, it doesn't belong in a store like this. I mean, you kind of wonder, who made the decision to order these products? You know, I mean, it's just, if you found that kind of stuff at a Walmart or something like that, yeah, people are going to get real upset because they don't understand... You know, when you buy uh, parody products from a parody website or, a, you know, or like maybe a, 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 if you go into a joke shop or something like that or, or someplace else that kind of specialize in, in these things, you know, that's one thing. Or I could see them selling these things at a place like Spencer, right? But, you know, you, you go in there, you understand that it's parody. But if this stuff is sitting right next to the, you know, L'Oreal and, you know, cover girl or whatever you know other products you can go what i mean it doesn't even belong on the shelves with that stuff it belongs um you know in uh, uh I, I can't even think of a, <laughs> of a place in like say a walmart or something like that where you would put it that it would fit so almost by the toy aisles or something the cosmetic aisle in the fancy stores, you know, where they're there doing the thing. You know? so. uh, I don't know. I don't know where to move to next. Let's move to, uh, I, I really like this story. This story actually got sent to me by a friend as well, besides this, this thing. Um, the interview with, with uh, Nate Wright, Tom Wright, um, about Christians being wrong about heaven. I really thought this was an interesting part. I'll let you introduce it and let you talk about it first. Uh, hey, he's got a purple shirt like mine. I, yeah. Uh, tonight it must be a purple night. Okay. Oh, very nice, Blaine. Another bishop. <laughs> well, he's a bishop too, so. Okay. Um, well, this is, this is from Time Magazine or um, Time Online. And uh, it's uh, he's a bishop in the Church of England, uh, Bishop of Durham, the fourth most senior cleric in the Church of England. And... Um, he has written a book called, uh, where is it? The Resurrection Sur of the Son of Surprised God. Surprised by Hope. No, no, that's, um, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, and he talks about heaven. And he, basically his argument is that the picture that you have in your head of heaven or the picture you see on TV, or, you know, if you ask your average Christian what does heaven look like, um, most people are wrong. And in fact, he says, really, when the Bible talks about heaven, the emphasis is not so much on heaven per se, 
the sort of the current heaven and what people think of, but on the final resurrection. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll tell you, I did two hospital visits today uh, with people who are both in a significant amount of pain. And when I went and talked to them, we talked a little bit about heaven, but mostly we talked about the resurrection. And uh, we looked at Romans 8, how um, where St. Paul says that I consider the suffering of the present time to be, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it says, but something to the effect of uh, not worthy to be compared to the glory that's about to be revealed to us. Um, because, you know, in, in other words, what he's saying is, you know, what, what we have to look forward to, when we get there, we're going to look back at our suffering, no matter how great our suffering was, and we're going to say, that was nothing. You know, and while, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to sort of put ourselves there and look back when we're in the middle of that suffering, um, that's what we have to look forward to. That is our hope. That's our assurance. I, and I think... Uh, my son, Josh, had to read a book last year for school, and I, I kept it. It's called Heaven is a Place on Earth by Michael Whitmer, I think is his last name, professor at Calvin College, and he's got a website, heavenisaplaceonearth.com. And he went after the same same issue. And actually, I've been thinking about it a lot, too, that we talk a lot about heaven, but the Bible doesn't. The Bible talks about the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I, I, I remember in high school, a friend of mine had a T-shirt saying, you know, only visiting this planet. Or we even have the hymn in our hymnal, you know, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. Yep. The reality is, no, we're only visiting heaven. Yep. This earth, is, you know, well, not technically this earth, but it means the new heaven and the new earth. But that is our real home. But, yeah. you know, being, um, you know, in heaven, in that intermediate state... That's not that's not the end of it all. The end of it all right. when the Lord comes again and we rise to the dead and, and, and live with him and in this new heaven and this new earth and what that's going to be like, we have no idea. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a couple things we need to talk about here. First of all, there's what is heaven actually like? And then and then the the next thing is the difference between have the current heaven and the final resurrection and what's going to happen then. All right. First of all, when you talk about heaven, it's funny that it's kind of ironic that we're doing this on Valentine's Day because the the cupids that you see at this time of year, who, by the way, is a pagan um, Roman god um, and, and in fact, is considered in some circles the god of homosexuality. Um, not always, though. Um, but uh, the um, a lot of people sort of picture that uh, that cherub the um you know baby with wings kind of thing which really has nothing to do with even the pagan god um he uh people picture that and they go oh yeah there's going to be all these little flying babies around and and you're going to be walking around on clouds and there's going to be and, and and the other way the angels are usually pictured are as women um but in the bible all of the angels are masculine um, and generally they're pictured as warriors or something like that. And in fact, the, the cherubim, you know, we talk about cherubs. Um, the cherubim, um, based on archaeology, probably looked like uh, sort of like a sphinx with wings. Um, but the point is that it's not the sort of walking around on clouds and strumming harps and, um, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. that that's not... You know, we get we don't get much in the way of description of the current heaven. But there's nothing about walking around on clouds and, you know, if you, if you go up in an airplane and, and you go up above the clouds and you look down, you're not going to see a bunch of people in robes and wings walking around. Well, it's, 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 the Bible says that we're sleeping. We're sleeping. I, I, I like to say when, when we die, we go to sleep in God's arms. And also I tell it, said, you know, when you, when, you were, when you were little and you went to sleep in mom's arms, it was the safest place in the world. When we die, we're asleep in God's arms. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us much about the intermediate state. The Bible doesn't tell us much about the new heaven and the new earth, other than it's going to be good. And there's a reason for that. If we knew, we'd gripe. 
I don't care what's yeah. there. Some well, people say, I don't like it. Well, the problem is that our human language and, you know, we, everything we understand, we, we understand based on comparison. You know, it's like this. All right. And we've got a whole bunch of descriptions of what the new creation is like. You know, the, the wolf will lie down with the lamb and, um, the lion will eat straw like the ox and stuff like that. And we look at that and we go, okay. Um, but, I like that's such a and that's the picture of the millennial kingdom that but we won't go there. <laughs> that's the <frog laughs> millennial friends. Um Yeah, sorry, Jim and I are a millennial. That's right. But anyway uh, but, or, or my other favorite description that I had a member of my last church and he just drove me crazy is talk is Isaiah sixty five and talks about somebody who's a hundred years old dying and with the consider oh, dying yeah. an infant and He's like, you know, there's no debt. Well, what, what are we going to die? I said, no. I said, how are you going to picture forever? I said, right. tell me, how do you how do you picture forever? What what? I said, yeah. you know, for what do you compare people, that to? You forever. They divorced in ten years. I mean, what is forever? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, kids, you know, running around. My BFF, my best friend, forever. You know, well, how long is forever? Till next week. <laughs> yeah, till next week. I said. So, you know, here the guy's trying, here Isaiah is trying to give us a picture of what forever is like. Well, for them, I mean, you know, when you, to live to be a hundred or something, it still is something to live that old. You know, somebody, you know, I've done a couple of funerals where people were a hundred, you know, but then, you know, a century. And here is he saying a century is barely infancy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's the point he's right. trying to make. That's that's the picture the point he's making. Wow. You know, and then when we look at um, a description of the new creation, and the best description we have is the the closing chapters of Revelation. But the problem is, if you look at the beginning of that description in Revelation twenty one, it talks about the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ. Well, the Bride of Christ isn't a place. It's a person. It's us. It's the Christian church. And so that description isn't even necessarily a description of the new creation. It's a description of God's people in the new creation. And, and you know, so then, it, then it really gets confusing <laughs> because you're trying to go, oh, this isn't even, this is describing us. And so, you know, then you, that's a real shift. So take, I encourage you, um, our viewers and listeners to go grab a Bible, open it up to the end and read the last two chapters of revelation with the, in mind that this is describing God's people in the new creation, not a place. Well, I think the key there is simply now the dwelling of God is with people. And he will be their God and they will be his people. The picture being the communion, the intimate relationship that God established in Eden will be fully restored fully realized we will be fully he will fully be our god we will fully be his people and god is infinitely deep therefore it will take an eternity for us to truly understand it hey, god, my brilliant. yeah you can feel that line. there was <laughs> it's it's out there for all to to uh to copy now yeah that's a very good um, line i like that line it's a creative commons license <laughs> but that's the idea it's it's if you look throughout the throughout the entire Old Testament, there was a covenant made. The covenant was, I will be their God, you will be my people. That began with Abraham. And you know, that, that and it worked throughout that, that phrase keeps coming back again and again and again. And Revelation, here's the fullness of it. I will be their God, they will be my people. The other way you can look at that is the dwelling place of God. Where did God dwell? In the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle. And later in the temple, he, he dwelt away from his people because nobody could go in the most holy place. When Jesus came, God dwelt um, in Jesus. Jesus was the temple of God. And he walked destroyed, among us. And he walked among us, destroyed this temple, and I will raise it in three days. Beginning with Pentecost, we became the temple of God. God no longer dwelt among the people, but in his people. We're now the temple of God. In the new heaven and the earth, the whole creation is the temple of God. Because John says, I looked at the city and there was no temple. Because we, 
everything will be the temple of God as God dwells with us. Completely. Impressive. One of the expressions that I used today at the hospital was, while you're going through this, God is with you. But in the new creation, you will be with him. Mm-hmm. By the way, all this we're talking about, you all want a good $5 word? Eschatology. So, if, you know, you know somebody, and they're going, why do you listen to that podcast for? What do you learn on that? I learn about eschatology. Which is literally the study of last things or the end times. Yeah. We had to go to seminary to learn big $5 words. (laughs) So we could sound smart. (laughs) Yeah, so we could sound smart, you know. Oh. You know, 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 that's, that's, that's just it. But, but yeah, you know, it's important to note that Isaiah does say heaven and earth will pass away. Mm-hmm. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. This 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 world is count, you know, and it goes really kind of back to, to the whole, you know, global warming and everything. My, my Bible class were studying Jesus signs of the last times and how the idea is that everything will continue to get worse and worse and worse until Christ comes to, you know, continue being in a crisis. Um and and I don't think we always think, really prepare ourselves enough for Christ's return. You know, and really think that, and that you know, if, if there's anything I, I kind of admire about, you know, our millennials friends, um, yeah, I'm not really into their dispensational and, you know, the, the end time stuff, the, the, the last, uh, the uh, left behind series. But they really do have an, an idea of looking at, you know, when, when is Jesus going to come? What are signs of his coming? Uh, it really is a, a, a deep desire. Uh, for them to yeah. know. But, you, you know, know I've, I've used the um, um, the expression or the illustration, right? If you knew for a fact that Jesus is coming back tomorrow, how would you live your life differently? Okay? Or if you knew for a fact that he's definitely not coming back tomorrow, would you live your life differently? For most people, we live like he's definitely not coming back tomorrow. Why is that? Because he said no one knows the day or the hour. He could be coming back tomorrow. He could be coming back before we get this done, and then I won't have to edit it. That's right. But that's just that I think if people said, if I knew he definitely was coming back tomorrow, I wouldn't go to work today. Um, Luther, of course, said if I knew the Lord was returning tomorrow, I'd plant an apple tree today. In other words, we always live. As if, you know, the Lord is coming back tomorrow. You know, and, and, and we continue just keeping things together uh, in our lives and continuing to, to share his word and continuing to reach out with his church. But uh, but I, I really encourage you to read this article on time. I think, I think Nate, uh, Tom Wright did a wonderful job with it. I was really very impressed. Um, Bishop Wright is just an A scholar and truly, a I think, a good conservative voice with the Native American communion. I also encourage you very strongly uh, the book uh, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Even though the guy's reformed, and he's very reformed, uh, it, it is a very good book, and he really does do a nice job of highlighting the fact that, you know, heaven heaven's a stopover point. The new heaven and the new earth, that's, that's where the real action is, the resurrection of the last day. And because everybody's thinking it, um, he's recommending the book, not the song by Belinda Carlisle. Okay. From the Go-Go's. Sorry, it had to be said. Everybody was thinking it. Everybody but me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but will Jews be in heaven? There's a transition. Let me go with this picture. That is the logo of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, the rabbinical... Mm. Ah, I can't find the Rabbinical Association. And by the way, that's the best picture I could find of it. It's kind of small. Slick looking. um, I think the way they tie the Hebrew butter into that plane. Yeah, isn't it? I thought it was pretty cool. That's a nice logo. They did a good job of that. I was wishing I could find a bigger one, though. So, uh, anyway, uh, last year, um, 
Pope Benedict, and we talked about this, uh, that he had uh, reinstated the Latin Mass. And uh, so they're going to... Uh, for Good Friday, there's a, uh, a prayer in the Latin Mass, uh, which uh, says that uh, uh, the Jewish people are in blindness and uh, that God would uh, uh, enlighten their hearts. Uh, uh, that they were bl- yeah, that they, the Jews were in blindness over Jesus and um, they had a phrase in there asking God to remove the veil from their hearts. And now it says, uh, let us also pray for the Jews so that God enlightens their hearts so that they may recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior of all people. And the rabbis weren't real happy about this. I don't think you're happy enough. I don't get it. I don't get what they're so upset about. I mean, this is a Latin mass, not a Hebrew one. All right. This is a Christian church, specifically a Roman Catholic church. It is a Good Friday service that recognizes that Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin. Right? And they're upset because he's going to say a prayer in Latin as part of this service, praying that the Jews would come to know Christ as their Savior. Right? He's praying for their salvation. He's praying that they may go to not only heaven, but the final resurrection, like we talked about. And they're offended. You and I would agree with that. I mean, but for them, it's saying, you know, uh, our our faith, our Judaism. And interesting enough, this is uh, this is not Orthodox Judaism. This is conservative Judaism, uh, which is a different animal. Uh, you know that, that that it's not viable. You know, it's not a, it's not real as far as God's concerned. Um, they quote a boxman uh, of the ADF. And he says, um, John Paul II taught that the Jewish people are the older brothers of Catholics and that Judaism has its own merits and viability. And there it is. That basically, you know, he's saying by this prayer is there's, you know, technically, technically there is no viability with, of, the, of Judaism before God. Well, Whatever John Paul said, or or um, however he kind of worked his words in order to be nice and diplomatic, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church has always been, to my knowledge at least, uh, the same as most other Christian churches, and that is that um, we're saved through Christ alone. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Most conservative Christian churches. Right. Yeah, you know, there are those who who would disagree. I mean, it's it's you know it, it's 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 hard for I think some people to get around their minds around that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. Churches, you know that that we are you know the children of Abraham by faith, uh, and this is actually uh, what uh, Dale's been preaching on Sunday. I read uh, read right over his sermon today. And uh, you know, that's what he was highlighting was, you know, that, 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 that by faith, all of us are really are children of Abraham. And Abraham's faith was not in sacrifices. Abraham's faith was in the promise of God, ultimately the promise of God's son. Yeah, we are not saved by the blood of Abraham. We're saved by the blood of Christ. And so was Abraham. And, you know, there's, if you talk to people who are involved in Jewish evangelism, uh, like Jews for Jesus or, uh, the Missouri Synod has our group called the Apple of His Eye, uh, ministries. And, um, they'll talk about that a lot of Christians believe in what's called the, uh, what do they call it? The two covenant theory. And the idea being that Christians are saved by Christ and, 
the Jews are saved by um, being descendants of Abraham. But, I mean, all over the place, but especially the book of Romans, very clearly points out that Abraham was not saved because of his genealogy. He was saved by his faith. What faith? His faith in, ultimately, in the coming Christ. His faith in the one who would be his descendant. And, and Paul in Romans uh, 9 through 11 points out that not all Israel are Israel. In other words, just because you're born that way doesn't mean you have the faith of Abraham. Right. Uh, and uh, at the same time, at the same time, uh, John Paul was right. The Jewish people are our older brothers. Okay? I mean, they really are. And, and Paul talks about that. Paul talks about that. You know, they are the olive tree, and that we've been grafted in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we're we're the wild ones. You know, we we shouldn't be there. Uh, in in Ephesians, Paul even calls us foreigners. <laughs> you know, we we were the and, and, uh, 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 and Peter says that once you are not a people. Yeah, but now you are the people of God. I mean, the the idea is that yeah, we we were the guy, we were the outsiders. God yep. chose Abraham. He chose Abraham's children. Uh, and and throughout the Book of Acts, consistently, Paul always goes to the synagogue first, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. First yep. to the Jews, and you know Jesus even said Lord. that. You know, he said uh, when the. I was getting mixed up. Was it the Syrophoenician woman or the Samaritan woman? Syrophoenician. Okay. Um, and she comes to Jesus and, and she asks um, for her was it daughter to be healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he says, oh, I didn't come for uh, for the for the Gentiles. I came for the for the children of Israel. And, uh, you know, and then she makes this, this great confession of faith and says, yeah, but, you know, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And so, you know, he heals her and, and it wasn't that she had to earn that, but he was, um, you know, he was going for that confession of faith there because she set a great example and, you know, it was good for all of us to hear that. Yeah. Interesting enough, by the way. There's twice Jesus says to somebody, you know, you have tremendous faith. Neither one of them is a Jew. Yeah, yeah, the other one was the, a Roman centurion. Yep, both of, both of them are Gentiles. And so, yep. you know, that's, that's, I think, one of the key things that we, you know, we have to keep in mind. Now, having said that, let's be honest, historically, Christendom has had a horrible, um, treatment of Jewish people. Yeah. I mean, um, Luther, of course, is probably best known for his very unfortunate tract on the Jews and their lies, which, you know, we always, every Lutheran church in America has repudiated and said so dissociated itself from it. But before that, <laughs> Luther had another tract called um, That Jesus Christ was Born a Jew. And in it, Luther said, you know, if I had been treated the way the Jews have been treated, well, I wouldn't want to become Christian either. I would hate Christians if I were them because they would, would mistreat them terribly. Yeah. And, you know, and he, he felt very bad about that treatment. This is not, you know, but you know, we got to stay away from the idea of any racial things of anti-Semitism. You know, this, is, this, is, this is simply that one question. How do you get to heaven? Do you do right. it because you don't eat cheeseburgers? Or do you do it because of God's grace? Now, is it stay away from ham sandwiches, or is it purely the grace of God? Right. It, you know, it's, it's what we get, keep getting back to. It's, it's not just the Jews. It's a question of um, what, what saves you. Is it something that you do, or something that God does for you? And the Bible very clearly states, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith alone because God has given us that. It is a gift of God. It's not something that we do. And it's not that the faith is actually what saves us. Uh, what is that line you have in your, 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 your sermon I like so much? In my sermon? Uh, faith is the 
knife that spreads the peanut butter of God's salvation on us or something yeah, like that. I loved that. I thought that was a great line. I thought that was a wonderful line. Um, uh, the way I like to look at it, and what I often do in my confirmation class, to I explain grace and faith this way. Uh, I walk in and I start throwing candy at them. And they start eating it. And then I look at them and I say, why did I give you the candy? Did any of you ask, answer a question? Did any of you ask what? No. That's grace. Grace gives you something for no good, for no reason at all. This gives it to you. Whether I didn't ask you if you've been good, I didn't ask you to do anything. I just gave it to you. Second question, why'd you eat it? And they took it. It's candy, you know. I who wouldn't, right? I mean, who wouldn't, right? Um, that's, a, that's faith. Faith uses what grace gives us. And the faith, I said, and the desire for the candy was created when I gave it to you. The grace creates the faith that receives it. None of you would have walked in and, you know, as grumpy as I am, would have said, hey, would you bring candy in today? You never would have thought it. But when you received it, then you used it. That's faith. I like that. You can steal that one, too. I have yet to have a confirmation class that does not like that illustration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, my, my so, confirmation kids, they love me because uh, I do things like that. And when they do, like, do their memory right, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always throwing out snicker bars. Yesterday it was Twinkies. They all got Twinkies for getting their, comp- their memory work right. And when everybody in the class gets the memory work good, uh, good or Good enough. Uh, then I then we have a pizza party. Uh, so my kids they, they think I'm great. I'm always giving them thanks. You know, I um, I I extended the time of our confirmation class so that uh, we used the first half hour just for working on memory work together as a group um, because they had, a lot of parents were complaining that the kids just don't have time with all their extra homework and stuff and. <laughs> I happen to know, because my daughter's one of the kids, that for some reason in this school district, they pile on so much homework in 7th and 8th grade, and then when you get to high school, it decreases. I don't understand it. It's irritating because she's, I mean, she doesn't goof off, and yet she's up until 10 o'clock at night every night. So so I said, fine, you know, we'll work together on it. That's what the church is all about anyway, is that, you know, we work together, we help each other out. And... um so what I did is one time um, when I when I first started doing that, one of the kids came in and he already had it memorized, even though he didn't need to. And I said, you know, look it over before you um, before you come to class. But, you know, we'll work on the memorization together. And uh, and he came in and he already knew it. And so uh, so I wrote his name up on the board and I wrote rocks after it, you know. He rocks and, um, and then, and he was all, he was all proud and he was excited and, and, uh, and so then the, the next week he had it again. And, and then the, the next week after that, somebody else had it that hadn't had it before and he was ready to go beginning before class even started. He was ready to go and, and he got it and I wrote his name up on the board and he turned to the other one and said, ha, who rocks now? <laughs> And so, I mean, it was really amazing because all of a sudden they were all anxious to, you know, they were memorizing it at home without me even telling them to, just so that I would write their names on the board. Mm-hmm. So. But mine gets snicker bars, and they still think that's pretty cool stuff. I'm cheaper than that. <laughs> well, I stock up on it. See, it starts off just around, the, you know, it starts off with Halloween, got all the Halloween candy out, so I get that. And then after Halloween, I stock up on the 50% off stuff. And then, uh, there you and then that gets me through Christmas. And then Christmas, I get all the, you know, Christmas themed stuff that's 50%, 75% off. And, you know, then I, then I throw that out. And, you know, that gets me through after Valentine's Day. And then after Valentine's Day, I get that. So I get all the stuff that's always on sale. Man, I was at the store today. Um, after I was done at the hospital, I stopped at the store and they had no Valentine's Day candy. I couldn't believe it because I was hoping, oh, Valentine's Day, I could probably get it cheap already, you know. Nada. I couldn't believe it. All the Easter stuff is out, but oh well. <laughs> anyway. Another month, it'll be Easter. 
<laughs> yeah. So, but speaking of the Pope, but is it me? I mean, just take a look at it, and and I mean no, you know, disrespect or anything, but does he look a little bit like Palpatine to you? I'm just saying, you know. I, okay, folks. You know, here it is. Here is your chance now to vote. <laughs> does does Pope does Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, does he look like Emperor Palpatine? You can you can vote on, and also give us any other comments you want at Crossfeed. I, I podcast at CrossfeedNews.com. Okay, so your vote here. Does he look like Emperor Palpatine? This this is your opportunity. And, and if you send it in, Dale will write on your, your, his chalkboard that you wrote. <laughs> so you, you'll get two things out of this, okay? <laughs> but matter of fact, what we'll do, even better, even better. We'll, we'll, we'll put it for a list, because I know Dale has these little credits and stuff at the end. We'll put it for a list of credits at the end next time. You there know? you go. So the people following you will rock, and, and we'll put your first name up there, you know. Uh, that, you know, so, so tell us, does he look like Emperor Palpatine to you? And, and give us that. Or you can call us at... I don't even have it with me. My daughter's borrowed my computer, and that's where it is. Oh, man. <laughs> it's okay. It's It'll, it'll appear on the screen. Okay, um, it'll appear on either, the screen, see? At, at some point, either now or sometime um, toward the end of the thing, because I always run that okay. well when I remember and um, if you, if so, you, or yeah. if you're watching this on iTunes, you can click on the screen, or you can go to crossfeednews.com and leave it uh, the message right there. Uh, <coughs> any of all those, please, please give us feedback. We're getting spammed all the time. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm looking for something real here, you know. But we got mm -hmm. some great comments a couple weeks yeah. ago. So well, and, here, here's your. And by the way, if we don't, um, I'm I'm really thinking about closing down the the phone line because we've been doing the show for like two years now and we haven't gotten a single phone call and I have to make a phone call every month just to keep it active and it's not a big deal but if if I mean if nobody's interested fine I'm not trying to guilt anybody into using it yes, um, but if you think it's a good thing <laughs> no 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 I'm, I'm Lutheran we don't do we don't use guilt but <laughs> except for time so it's time to get the budget made. Oh, well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, you should see um, Dale. I mean, he has his kids come in in rags, you know, and you know, look at the pastor's family; they're starving because you people won't give your offering, you know. And... <laughs> All right. Anyway, back to. I'm sorry. That's my church. I'm sorry. I... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> back to Pope Pelp. I mean, um, Benedict. <laughs> Really, I mean, it, you know, it's just one of those separated at birth things, you know. Um, you know what? He, we better we better thank Palm Pilot here. You know, for, you know, our, our our sponsor. Just get out of this before we get ourselves any deeper today. <laughs> well, this is a cool story, though. Right? We can't skip over this story completely. Um, because we haven't done the story yet. Um, Which one? He's the SMS one. Oh. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, we have another story yet. <laughs> I forgot that one. All right, Pope Benedict is providing moral support. That's why I have the picture. <laughs> I mean, I know we were just talking about him, but oh, yeah, I thought um, you put it up from, there having to deal with the prayer. I forgot. I forgot all about the text message board thing. I forgot about that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, he's providing moral support to Austrian Catholics during Lent with an encouraging SMS on their mobile phones. So you can sign up for the new service. Um, and uh, this is this is just in Austria, but uh, he is encouraging other leaders to do the same, I believe. Um, and you get daily quotes from the from the Pope during the 40 days of Lent to help you survive the traditional fasting period leading up to Easter. Um, yeah, some of them are inspirational, but further development and dignity of society depends on those who do more than their duty. Uh, our resignation in the face of truth is, I'm convinced, at the core of the crisis in the Western and in Europe. Um, they're from his speeches and things, and this is his desire to, to reach a younger crowd. I mean, this, this is a, I, I think this is a cool idea, actually. Mm -hmm. so He's I hip. don't really know if I went daily 
text messages from Jerry Kieschnick on my phone, but that, that does be another thing, you know, I just, I don't do text messaging, I try to stay away from it. Um, we had, this, we had these weird people in Massachusetts who drive and text message at the same time. I think oh. we were surprised to get the accidents. Oh, um, plenty of people do. You know, um, it's just, it's just but, crazy. See, now he needs to get Twitter, to use Twitter. Then everybody can get his text messages. Oh, okay. So, I use Twitter. Anybody wants to, um, my Twitter uh, name is TTFFDale. So, um, you can listen to me or subscribe to my feed or however you call it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's the, kind of a neat idea. Uh, I sure, Ross, uh, you know, I think it's a neat way to, 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 to encourage people in their Latin walk and really their daily life. I mean, I would, uh, why not put it out, uh, all the time? Yeah. Now there is a service out there that I used to. Well, I'm sub, I'm subscribed to it, but it's kind of fallen apart. Um, I can't even remember what it was called now. But it's a. It was a like a daily Bible verse. Mm. And um, do you get us a text message? Uh, the problem was sometimes the verse was longer than your maximum thing, so you only get half of it. Which, you know, sometimes is bad when you get like, the wages of sin is death. <laughs> and you don't get the rest, you know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but, um. So he went out and hanged himself. Now go and do it with the guys. So, uh, I, I, I think the problem with it was they couldn't get, um, sponsors for it because it was a, it, it would have like the verse and then there would be the sponsor. But of course, if it got chopped off, the sponsor would get chopped off too. And, <laughs> So I I think they just couldn't make it viable to use a word that we've been using, um, but there's there's lots of uh, you can, lots of like email. Um, uh, one of my favorites is from the World English Bible, which is a uh, Creative Commons it's freely distributable Bible translation. It's a really good translation. It's um, it's not always very readable necessarily. Uh, just because it's a very literal translation. It's, it's a good study, uh, translation, uh, sort of like the NASB. And, um, and you can subscribe to their, uh, they'll send you three, it's like three chapters a day, um, to read. And, uh, actually I think it's, might even be twice, like three chapters from the Old Testament, three chapters from the New Testament or something like that. Uh, if you go to ebible.org, um, you can check that out if you're interested. But there's, I mean, there's tons of other ones out there too. So, very useful, very helpful. You know, Bob, email. Good reminder. You know, sometimes I've, I've found that these kind of things can be really helpful just as a, um, kind of a, you know, we talked about, uh, last episode about picking up something for Lent. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here that, um, it's, you know, and besides just giving something up, how about getting into a good habit? Um, not just getting rid of a bad habit. Um, and, and not just, you know, for Lent, but, but all the time. And I found that for me, I mean, the first thing that I do is check my email. And, um, so if I get a devotion as an email, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to read it. Or if I get some Bible verses as an email or something like that, I'm going to read it. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a way to encourage yourself to, um, to, to set some time aside each day to spend with Jesus. Oh, very nice, Blaine. That's pretty much it for the night now. Yeah. You got comments if you think. We have Pope Palpatine up there. Let us know. We want to know what you think. Uh, if you think we're a couple smart outs, let us know that too. <laughs> if you don't think we're too bright, well, I guess you can tell us that too. But I think we already know that one. Uh, anyway, um, like I said, you can send us to 
podcast at crossfeednews.com or you can click on the screen or you can dial that number that Dale's going to put up there on the screen for you. You've, you've probably already seen it by now in the episode. I usually run it before this point. Okay. Or else I'll forget completely. Quick out shout out to pdaperformance.com. Check out their cool software for the Palm OS. And uh, happy Valentine's Day, a little late to everybody. Well, and, and have a good President's Day weekend. And for those of us up here in the Northeast, have a good February break next week. And you and your kids are all off and people start to head to Florida. <laughs> My kids are mad because they actually have to go back to school after uh, after Memorial Day now because they missed a day of school. Uh, up here, they don't get out of school till like the end of June, no, the third third week of June, because they get a week off in uh, February, and they get another week off in April. But it keeps people in Florida happy. Oh well, <laughs> take care, everybody. God bless. Have a good weekend. Night, everybody. God bless.